Hello and welcome to Wizards, Warriors and Words, a fantasy writing advice podcast. I'm Jed Hearn, author of Thunder Heist, and I'm joined by my co-hosts, starting with Dirk. I am Dirk Ashton, and I really wish I would have written this, because it's... <laughs> He's holding up Malice by John Gwynn, uh, also joined by Rob. Hi, I'm, I'm, uh, I'll be Michael R. Fletcher today, you know what, why not? Uh, and uh, I, I also wrote Malice. Uh, and Valor, <laughs> and Ruin, and Draft. <laughs> <laughs> and lastly, uh, Mike. I guess that makes me Rob Hayes, and I'm realizing that my uh, office turns into a sauna in the summer if I close the door, because it is. <laughs> Ooh, balls in here, holy crap. <laughs> and, and he's in, like, the North Pole. Yeah, I reckon. Pole, Next yeah. to Santa's workshop. <laughs> he's in Santa's workshop. He is he's Santa. An elf. Makes sense. <laughs> oh, God, my car lecture is Santa. <laughs> That's never going to go well. Yeah, Christmas is cancelled, guys. Room dark Christmas. Uh, and we are joined today by a very special guest, John Gwynn. John, welcome to the show. Hey, guys. Hello. Thanks for the invite. It's great to be here. And you have a new book out. Yes. I do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm prepared, but I don't even have it here. But, the um, Shadow I of do. the Gods. Yeah, Shadow of the Gods. It's got that amazing dragon in that little bitty guy. <laughs> oh, that, that cover, that promises. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's the fact that it's the dragon exactly extends that. onto the back cover as well that really gets me. I'm like, me yes. too. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm I've really got that. I've cover. got that on order now. I was like, <laughs> shit, I should have ordered it last week. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Just a little spoiler. Well, not really a spoiler, but a little, just a little giveaway. The guy on the front of the cover that you just mentioned is actually a woman. Oh, oh, yeah. oh <laughs> even better. <laughs> I thought you were going to spoil it by saying there isn't actually a dragon in the story. <laughs> yeah, not at all. No, there's no dragons in this book. Yeah, a lot of a lot of people don't catch that this is actually a woman on the front of my last book too. Yeah, War of cool. Gods, the last Eternus so, book. Yeah, written by John Gwynn. So it's actually. <laughs> um, um, also, really super quick thing before we get into this episode. Speaking of covers, both myself and Rob have had our covers shortlisted for. Mark Lawrence's self-published fantasy book off. Um, basically, if you don't know what it is, 300 independently published books enter this thing. One wins the award for like best written book, but then there's also a separate best cover design award, um, which they choose 30 covers on the shortlist and then the public vote. So I'll put a link in the show notes, but if you want to check out the other shortlisted entries, uh, I've got the Thunder Heist up there. Rob has got Along the Razor's Edge. Um, yeah, you can vote for your favorite book. Doesn't have to be one of ours, but we would appreciate it. You can vote somebody them all in the... as well to vote for all your favorite covers. <laughs> you can actually somebody in this group actually won the SPFBL one year. That's right, Rob did. And no, Mike no, got... it wasn't me. Yeah, 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 it was. We don't, we don't like Rob. <laughs> you know? It's the year after I was in when I took third. That's it, and then Mike got second. So we've got all. Yeah, at least I places. didn't get third. No, nope. third. I mean, that's <laughs> so I totally even what we're talking about. Uh, anyway, but yes, we have John on today and uh, we thought we'd talk a bit about characters because John, you've had some pretty high praise for the characterization in your books. Um, so we were wondering, like, where do you kind of start when it comes to designing your characters? Are they sort of one of the, the main first sources of inspiration that comes to you when you're writing a novel or is it the world? What is your, are you sort of thinking about when you're developing your characters? Uh <laughs> It's, it's, I mean, it's, it's hard to be self-analytical like that, but um, I think it's, it's not as organised as it is probably going to sound. It's more of a, just a big mess in my head that, st that starts to become untangled uh, the, the more I work through it. So I'm, I'm really thinking about all of it at the same time. You know, I'm not, I don't kind of think, right, I'm thinking about characters now and I'm thinking about world building. It's just all going on. In, in my head at the same time. Um, I often kind of start with, with a spark for the story. So, um, so for example, uh, the, my latest book, The Shadow of the Gods, which is a Norse inspired trilogy. The spark for that was reading um, the Poetic Edda. There's a book in there called the Voluspa or the Ceres's Prophecy. And there's, um, a, a, there's just a beautiful little passage at the end of that, a few couple of paragraphs where it's talking about Ragnarok you know, that end of days battle with the Norse gods. And, um, and at the end of it, all the gods are dead, you know, there's, there's a few survivors. And then out of the ashes rises this dragon, um, Nithoga, who is, 
who is um, kind of locked up in chambers beneath Yggdrasil, a world tree. And the passage, the, C the CRS um, Velispa describes this dragon emerging from the ashes and rising into the air, and there are corpses hanging from his wings. And, uh, and I read that and I kind of sat back and thought, wow, that's cool. And then I thought, I wonder what happened next? You know, and that was kind of the, that was the spark that started this, this whole trilogy rolling, you know. Um, but at the same time, obviously you're thinking about a story, to, an original story to tell, you're thinking about characters to, um, to view though that story from. So, so very often with my characters, I'll, I'll come up with a series of events, a rough series of events that, of events that I'm thinking about um, fitting into the story. And then, and, and then I'll start thinking about what kind of what perspective would make these events the most interesting they can be or the most exciting or engaging that's that's usually my process for for um for for starting for to build my characters in saying that i don't do it like that every time so for example there's a there's a i like to play around with tropes a little bit um you know i like tropes some people think they're a swear word but um, I think, you know, they're, they're tropes are tropes for a reason, you know, because we, we all can, they're, they're relatable and, and so on. But I think the important thing is that you try and give them a fresh spin, maybe subvert them, um, just try and do something original and contemporary with them. That, that, that's um, the important thing uh, for me. So I was thinking there's a trope that I've, I've wanted to write for a long time, which is that um, retired person of violence. You know, so like um, William favorites. Money in uh, Unforgiven, you know, Clint Eastwood or um, or Logan, you know, in the Logan movie, something like some, you know, David Gemmell wrote many characters like that. Who, he's one of my favorite um, inspirational writers. So I wanted I wanted to do something with that kind of trope. And I remember talking to my agent, um, Julie Crisp, about very early on in before I'd written anything, really just talking about ideas. And we were talking backwards and forwards. And during the conversation, it came out that why don't you try um, s switching the gender and making this, because usually this character, that trope is written as a male. So mm. I've written it as a female. Um, and that's where Orca came from. And she was really kind of right in the heart of the story from the very beginning. So, um, you know, I, I think character work, it's, it, there's no given set rules are there with writing we all know you know you you just we just kind of fight stumble our own way through it and find our own way and it's usually just um a combination or a synthesis of lots of different ideas and lots of different approaches and it's just what works for you so very often i'll write characters um that that i i think will be able to tell events well but sometimes i'll just come up with one that you know, becomes kind of a heart of the story before I've even started anything else. So it, 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 it you know, it, there's there's a few different ways I approach it. But um, hopefully they come out all right. I never feel I never feel I always feel too close to my writing to really know if they've come out well or not. So I just leave that to. They they to do trust it. me. They do. Thank you. <laughs> Um, I mean, to be honest, one of the things I wanted to ask you was um, like, how how well do you plan the character development? Because um, having read the the Faithful and the Fallen uh, series, um, what I found was by the end of the first book, I was like, this is good epic fantasy. There's a hell of a lot of characters. I'm not sure like you know where all of them are going to fit in. But and then it was sometime during the the second book where I suddenly realized that I was invested in every single character because of the, the sheer amount of development that you were putting them through. Like e even the bad guys, the, the villains, I was invested in them because I wanted to see them die. Um, <laughs> but, and uh, that was because you kept seeing them sort of like change and develop as the story went on. So like how much planning do you actually put into, into that development? I mean, that's brilliant to hear you say that, Rob. Thank you, mate. Uh, I'm, really, I'm really pleased about that. But the, the honest answer is, is um, not much. It's, it's more like, it's more like I'll, I, I'll, um, once I get my characters together, I, I, I do spend some time thinking about their backstories and their psychology, you know, and um, the kind of people they are. And then it's a bit like, um, because I'm kind of, I'm not really, I'm really in between the gardener and the architect, you know, I, I do a bit of both. 
So I'll, I'll, I'll do my architectural work in, in terms of events for the story. And then it's a bit like um, painting, you know, it's like joining the dots. So I'll have my, my, my kind of timeline of events roughly worked out and I'll have my characters worked out with their backstories. And then it's just like letting them loose, you know, like, um, like, like, uh, like dog racing, you know, you just, the, the, <laughs> the cages come Open up the gates and see who wins <laughs> and the dogs all come out and I just kind of see where they go. And I, for me, the, the most important thing is just to try and be true to kind of the, the character profiles that I've come up with and in, in the events that they find themselves trying to put, put yourself in their place and make the decisions that they would make under those conditions. Um, that, that's really how I, I, once I've started writing, that's how I work out my characters. So I don't really spend a lot of time thinking ahead to book, you know, to book two and book three or book four about, about their character arcs. I just hope that they feel authentic and realistic as they're going through, you know, all the, all the, <laughs> the very unpleasant things that I hurl at them. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think uh, Macquin, for one, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. It's definitely he, he went through some some shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, he, he again. See, he, that's an interesting one you mentioned because a lot of a lot of people he he tends to be a, a, one of the favourites from um, that series that I hear about. But I hadn't even originally planned him as a point of view when I wrote Malice. Um, he was with another character, and my my. Um, agent Julie Crisp, who was my editor then, uh, she, she she read the first draft of Malice and she was like, you've killed a lot of people at the end of this book. But I think, <laughs> she said, but I think you could probably kill some more. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, okay, I'll have a think about that. And I and so I killed a character who I was going to continue with in book two and the POV torch kind of passed from that character to Maquin. So that when he became a, a POV, he was going to still, he was going to, you know, be going through the same things, but not. I wasn't going to write him as a, an actual point of view. So that's kind of a good example of how organic the writing process can be, I suppose. Well, yeah. What kind and also of to listen to your editor when they say to kill people. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You should always listen to your editor. Most of the time. <laughs> Um, John, what kind of questions are you asking yourself to sort of flesh out those backstories for your characters? Um, well, you, uh, you know, when you're writing, you try to be mindful that you don't want to write the same character. Um, so you just want to want to come up with um, things that are unique, and some, and also just um, kind of a personality profile that if you have two people going through the same thing, that they would both react differently. I think, you know, things like that are important to me. So, um, you know, their family backgrounds, their kind of, their, their moral compass, um, their ambition, uh, what's important to them. All those kind of questions are, are what I, I'm jotting down and thinking about as, as, as I'm fleshing out my characters. I think yeah, Dirk's okay. muted. Oh, wait, Dirk's saying something? <laughs> he's, he's speaking. I can see Dirk yeah, speaking. I can see his mouth moving. This, uh, this is the best we've ever had him. I know. <laughs> oh, I swear gone. I haven't muted Dirk. What's happening? <laughs> um, sorry, this is Dirk. how professional we are. Yeah. One of us is, doesn't even know it. Uh, let me see if I can press some buttons to magically make it work. Um, <laughs> Come on, Dirk. Dirk, type can your you... question, Dirk. We'll ask yeah, you type your question. You. That's a good idea. Type <laughs> your question using the chat feature, which is just down the bottom of Zoom. If you put your mouse down the bottom where it says chat next to share screen and then just type it in there. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> this is not a shambles. Um, <laughs> okay, while we're waiting for that, um, John, how do you make minor characters interesting? Like when they don't get a lot of screen time, you know, they're not, maybe they don't even have a point of view. How do you still make them kind of interesting and compelling characters for, yeah, people to read about any sort of tricks or or the like i suppose to, I mean, to these are good questions. somebody and it's stuff that i don't actually consciously think about so i'm trying to kind of work it out as you ask me the question I, um i mean i'm i'm very i always try to write 
something where there's there's a um, kind of a camaraderie and a banter between um, groups of people. Um, you know, friendship and family are always kind of big big themes for me. And I think you know when, especially amongst friendships, um, you've always got that that kind of deep personal. Uh, it's, it, there's a banter going on between you where um you know you may may love your, your mates but uh the way you speak to them might not actually reflect that you know it's um and so <laughs> especially if you're the, if they're your best friend it's like you speak yeah. to your best friend a little bit differently to most people it's like it yeah. can be quite sort of pointed but you're still friends yeah i mean just look at you guys you know <laughs> <laughs> the way you guys are chatting to each other but so i, I We're think it's tame just... today john <laughs> you see us some <laughs> times it's brutal so i mean that's all i'm i'm usually looking for is just something that that feels uh, a little bit individual and unique uh, a little bit quirky and, and then kind of taking those tropes so you always with, with your side characters you know you might have the mentor or you'll you'll have the friends and and um you know, usually one of them's a big guy, one of them's a, a slim guy, and they have personality traits. But I just try and move them away from the tropes and, so that they feel realistic. And and I, I think of them really as, as, as if um, these guys were kind of hanging out at the pub together. What, what would be the kind of chat they were having? You know, that so, so those are kind of the thoughts that I'm that I often have going through the, the back of my mind as I'm writing characters even though they're, they're usually not sitting in a pub, they, they might be um, standing in a shield wall or something. <laughs> but, you know, that kind of familiarity amongst friends um, and amongst enemies, you know, uh, the, the way you'd, the, um, the reactions can, can um, dominate how you respond. So, you know, the, the fight or flight instincts and that kind of thing are quite strong in the human race aren't they and you can either freeze up or you can um or you can swell your chest and or you can just get on with it, be quiet and get on with it and all these different kind of reactions i i just try i try and make sure that i never give the two different characters the same kind of personality traits so that they don't feel the same you know that that's one of the, the main things i i do make an effort to try and do so that the characters that are, are in there have their own kind of unique voice, if you like. So um, they're memorable. And how do you? Oh, sorry. I don't know. Can you guys, can you guys hear me now? <laughs> yes, Dirk, we can hear you now. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> I had good uh, job. I like that. Somehow I got this little thing. The mic got turned off. I was just going to ask <laughs> how many, how how much, how many with a cast like you have two things. How many notes do you put down mm. as far as the a number of characters because you've got a ton of characters and I ran into the same thing with my books um, and also how, I know it comes you, you think of main characters and main PO, POVs but I kind of always end up starting with like icons you know tropes you know like you've got your uh, main character which has certain characteristics and might be a little naive or neurotic or then they need to have a buddy character right they need to have a mentor character there needs to yeah. be bad guys and bad guy minions do yeah. you do you kind of lay out something like that before you get started and how many notes do you take on each one as far as their character traits yeah yeah definitely uh, i think as the books have gone on, the the notes started um, when I wrote Malice. I had folders, you know, but now it's it's um, it's just a lot more concise. Mm -hmm. uh, you you just feel like you, you get comfortable with what you're doing. Um, so yeah, I definitely do that. Um, and um, so for the later series, the Bloodsworn Saga, I've got a. Uh, I've got a doc, you know, I've just got a document that I call Blood Swan Saga Research, and basically everything's in there, all my characters, all my names, places, um, all the source kind of references that I've used. It's all in just this one document. And so um as to how big it is, it's um it's probably a for for characterization, a few four or five pages, something like that. Oh, that's that's good. Much better than my hundreds. 
for, for the, the same the way I do it as well, to be honest. I have a, uh, a few pages, um, and most of it is just keeping track of things that I will otherwise forget, like, you know, eye colour. If I've mentioned the character's eye colour, I have to make yep. a note of it, or otherwise it will change. Yes. Yep. <laughs> yep. You know, it's funny you should say that, because I'm... I'm uh, I've just written book two in the series and I spent so much time flicking back to remind myself of what characters were wearing, hair colour, eye colour, you know, any distinguishing kind of physical marks that, that favorite, I'm- Favourite weapon. <laughs> I'm only catching up to this now, which is ridiculous, you know, yeah. eight books in. And um, yeah, I do the same so thing. Literally yesterday, I was, I was just going through book one and writing and writing down all those kind of characteristical um, descriptions so that when I get to book three, I won't, I won't waste half, half of the time flicking through book one and <laughs> yes. two. I, uh, I have to keep a list of names because I'm, I'm terrible at names in general. I remember people's faces, but I, t I have to meet someone and talk to them like a dozen times before I remember names <laughs> usually. Um, but uh, Dirk Ashton, that's what in, we do. In, in books, it's even worse because I just, I don't remember what they're, I mean, and I'm in the books I'm writing now, I'm using like, um, you know, like, uh, like the, whatever the thing is called in the middle of the name, like uh, uh, Mon, you know, or San or, or as in, in Abercrombie uses Dan. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I've got a ton of those and I just don't remember what they are. So I constantly have to refer, <laughs> refer back. Yeah, <laughs> no, notes are really helpful. Yeah, my main character's mother's name. I keep forgetting it. So I have to go back. I have that open so I can look right away. Oh, yeah. So I don't have to put brackets mom, mom's name. Yeah. No. Ugh. Oh, no, well, you've got to do that. You have your placeholders where you're like, I, I occasionally oh. just have like, Everywhere, in, in bold, just bold and caps, just name because yeah. I completely yeah. forgot on yep. it, or I have to make it yep. up or something. Exactly. They make, it, <laughs> they make it into like the um, into my alpha and beta drafts, and so yeah. many times I get feedback from one of my, my readers who just come back. Um, um, I don't know about this name, and it's like it's just name. It's like yeah, no, <laughs> Not that. yeah, yeah. I'm very That's why I, I, uh, beta readers, it's like uh, you I know, always you put those in brackets <laughs> so I can search them. <laughs> and fix them later. Ugh. I've been using a, um, a software recently, cause yeah, like John, as you were saying, we're trying to keep track of everything. Like I realized that with the, the series I'm about to write, it's gonna be yeah mental to try to keep track of everything. So I've just started using this software called WickedPad, which I think Brandon Sanderson uses for his like internal continuity stuff. And it's been a yeah. little tricky to, to first get, but like, it's really useful. Cause you basically just like type in a name of a character and then it automatically creates a page for it where you can put details down for that character and you can link it to everything else and yeah so hopefully that will mean that i don't have to run into the same issue of yeah yeah there are a lot like of two hundred thousand word <laughs> book just to get the eye color of a character being so organized yet <laughs> yeah there, <laughs> there, are, there are a lot there are a lot of nifty toys to mm. use in right what is the software program everybody loves that i terrify scrivener, scrivener. Do you, that's what you use isn't it yep Used it a bit in the and past. that keeps yeah. do you use anything like that john what do you write in i used to write I, I started with scrivener and um i just after a while i felt like i wasn't really using it the way it should be used so i just went back to word so i That's just do everything in word do. now yeah exact and same I, thing happened to me yeah i used it for a yeah, couple of books and then i was like i don't need all this extra functionality yeah yeah i mean i probably do need it but i don't I'm, ter I'm such a slow writer anyway. I'm terrified of taking the time to learn how to use it. Yeah. And I've heard about weird bugs and stuff about trying to export. So I just, I'm no, I'm sticking with word. I'm sticking with John Gwynn and, uh, and Joe Abercrombie. Just write it in word. You know what? George R. R. Martin, stick, though, stick who George R. R. Martin in... instead. Go yeah. back to DOS. Yeah, exactly. From like the 90s. <laughs> <laughs> So good. Um, Mike, do you have any, any questions for John about characters before we wrap up this episode, which we probably will do soonish? Uh, not, you know, qu characters, not so much. I, I actually threw up a thing on a uh, Twitter, just asking if there were any sort of fan questions. Mm. Uh, and one came up totally gun character related, but frankly, I never stay on topic anyway. That's fine. Um, so, uh, 
they said that uh, you uh, came to writing, John, like fairly late in life in your 30s, which frankly really fucking upset me because that's not late. No, uh, it's and, not late. No. What are you talking asked, about? You know, that's a lifetime away. <laughs> and they asked sort of what had changed in, in the industry and in the sort of like the writing environment. Basically, what had, what's changed? You know, what what's changed? What have you seen, you know, since then when you were ancient in your 30s? Hmm. <laughs> so i started writing in my 30s but i didn't get um a publishing deal until uh, closer to 40 um 2010 i got my my first deal and i started writing in 2002 um i remember that because i just got home with the family from watching the two towers at the cinema and movie. we were all sitting around the table and it just so just for a bit of backstory um uh, so for some context i i used to teach at um a local university and i was studying moving on to do my phd there but my daughter harriet's profoundly disabled um she has epilepsy and all, uh, all kinds of other things so um she was going through a particularly bad patch so i stepped out of um uni and studying to um to help my wife at home and we we were her carers and so um during that kind of period um i started thinking i could do with a do with a hobby at home you know something i can do that, that i can do from home and so so then um we we went to see uh, the two towers at the cinema came back and i said oh you should try giving writing a go and i was like no don't be silly you know you need things like well, talent for a start, and plot, <laughs> that kind of thing. I, I wouldn't know where to start. And then, then um, two, two of my boys heard the conversation and they got into it and they're like, oh, go on, Dad, give it a go. So I started to think, oh, okay, well, actually, that might be fun. So um, so that's where I, that's when I started. And it was in 2002, the, the end, I think. And, um, and that's when I started working on Malice because I'd not written anything creatively up to that point. I mean, I've read uh, until books were coming out of my ears, you know, but I'd never thought of making the leap to write. So that's when I started. And, and it was just as a hobby, you know, in the bedroom. And I was really just thinking of, of my audience being my wife and, and children. But that, and Malice was the foot was the, and the, the, um, the faithful and the fallen was what I, what I started working on. So time, it was, it was quite strange. I mean, looking back now, the thing that's changed the most, I think, to answer the actual question, Michael, sorry, mate, I was digressing a bit there, but to answer the question, the thing that I think has changed the most is, is, um, is the internet, social media, you know, it's, it's, um, it's brilliant now, you know, where you, we, we can do things like this. Um, it, when I started writing, it felt quite, I mean, the internet was going, but um, maybe it was just me, but it was, if, it, if it, it, it didn't, it felt quite isolated being a writer, you know. It still does sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Like sure. In your office or wherever you write, and you just you're completely on your own and cut off from yeah. the rest of the world. It, it certainly can. Yeah, yeah. But Unless I, you I have a suit of armor behind you, which has its own sentience and gives you advice <laughs> when you're writing scenes inaccurately. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And I, well, I remember I was at Forbidden Planet a few years ago um, for like a book launch, and one of the the guys that that. Uh, the, the manager at the shop on the day said that you know they always love doing signings but they see a lot le lot fewer people turning up to signings since the internet has really taken off because mm. so many people would go to ask you know similar questions to we're chatting about today you know um uh, who budding writers wanted to sure. ask um um you know professional writers these questions or published or and you don't get as much of that now because they can and just dm you, you know? yeah. <laughs> so yeah you, know, you get people turning up if they want their book signed but but not so much because they you know they want to pick your brain because they can do that on the internet so the that's good, really changed massively the good the good the good thing that's come out of that is that uh yeah the signings and stuff are are much smaller but the cons the conferences have grown because more people yeah. hear about them more people know about them and, you know, you go to those things and the lines for the signings at those things are endless. And the, and yeah. the panels, if, if authors people like are on the panels, they just pack full um, and have to turn people away. So, I mean, those, those are still hopping. Um, 
Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah that's probably because of the internet, because more people find out about them and hear about them. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. It's cool. That. Yeah. The, so the thing I'm taking away from your this. first book, the first thing you wrote. Yeah. That's incredible. <laughs> that's insane. I was that thinking blows me away. And I, yeah, me too. Because when I read that, I was reading that as like, this is a really mature writer who's been doing this for a long time. <laughs> I had no idea no. That, that was your first, that that could have possibly been come out of someone's mind who had never actually thought about doing fantasy creative writing before. Like, Here's my I hobby mean, I'm book. Blo I'm, I'm blown away. Yeah. Well, it went through a big edit. <laughs> Still. <laughs> it's so bloody good. I, I think we're all united in, in, in this when we say, ooh, we hate you. Yeah. <laughs> but, 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 but in a, a very... Constructive jealousy, Rob, what are you talking about? Not envy. Yeah, it's, a, it's, 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 it's a very loving hate. Yes. yes. That's it. <laughs> awesome. All right, well, um, I think we'll probably uh, put a pause to this conversation there. We're going to have John back again for an episode, maybe next week, maybe a week after. Not sure how these are going to come out. Um, but thank you for everyone for listening to this episode. Oh, John, tell us quickly about uh, your latest book, Shadow of, is it The Shadow of Gods? Is that correct? The Shadow of the Shadow Gods. Of God. yeah. So that's book one of a, uh, a trilogy called The Bloodsworn Saga. It's a very, um, very much Norse-inspired tale. Um inspired from my kind of right from my childhood love for Norse mythology, um, Viking era history, and of you know, and, and as an adult, I'm a Viking reenactor. So all of those kind of passions are, are thrown into the pot in this series and stirred up. So I hope um I hope that it feels very Norse and very fantastical. Um I spent a lot of time researching kind of uh, uh Norse mythology, but I didn't want it to feel like it's just a book about Thor and Odin and Loki, you know. So I've 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 come up with my own pantheon pantheon of gods that hopefully kind of tip the hat to those guys. But um but uh, hopefully it feels like it's a, a fresh take as well. I spent a lot of time looking into um Norse mythology, like your history, Scandinavian folklore, and I'd say that this this book uh, called Vaisen by Johan Egerkrans was a, a real goldmine for the book. So it, it, there's a lot of kind of lesser-known Norse creatures um, that are found in there that, uh, that um, I had a lot of fun slipping into 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 the tale. Um, and it's it's um, hopefully it feels like um, sorry that's by Johan Egerkrans. Okay. Egg. I'm going to put a, I'll put a note for that, like a link to that book in the show notes. So if you guys are interested in checking that out, you can. Uh, so I'm ordering it today. <laughs> <laughs> I just Wait. wrote it down. Dirk likes myths. Who would have thought? Um, I think we can, no. actually, we can actually use this as an opportunity to tease our next episode, because I think the next episode we'll be getting into some more um, Viking myths and, and folklore and reenactment because uh, we have two Viking reenactors on this podcast. So Stick around and you'll find out which one the other Dude. one is. Well, maybe a former, <laughs> a former Viking reenactor. A, a, like, like John was saying, you know, a, a man of violence who has retired from the game but has to get back into it. <laughs> score. All right. Uh, John, thank you for joining the show and thank you everybody thank for you, listening or watching. See you guys. Thanks for the invite, guys. Great to be here. <laughs>